Thank good afternoon or good evening to colleagues joining the uh, CG annual conference. And thanks for joining the section uh, talking about higher education and mental health. We have uh, three speakers in this panel. Um, we will have you know, Dr. Graham Lewis from University College London, uh, Dr. Uh, Pat Moore, uh, Moore from Lingnan University, Hong Kong, and also Dr. Jason Audi from Durham University. So without further ado, I would like to invite Gemma from UCL to share about her research relating to uh, the general mental health on students. So this is your floor, Dr. Lewis. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. So I'm just going to share my screen. Give me a second. Okay, so hopefully that looks okay and everyone can hear me okay. So thank you for the introduction. Today I'm going to be talking about students and mental health. So yeah, as Carho said, my name is Dr. Gemma Lewis and I'm a senior research fellow and lecturer in psychiatric epidemiology at UCL Division of Psychiatry. So yeah, just to give a brief uh, a brief structure to what I'm going to talk about. I'm just going to I'm going to talk about mental health, what I mean by mental health and, and what I research. I'm then going to talk about mental health of higher education students uh, generally and also compared with the rest of the the rest of the general population. I'm then also going to talk about some inequalities or, or risk factors for mental health problems within the higher education population. And then I'll just reach some some general conclusions to stimulate our discussion later on. So. As a brief introduction to mental health, so my main areas of research are depression and anxiety, which are the two most common mental health problems, and they are often referred to as common mental health problems. And depression and anxiety often occur together, so they're often comorbid mental health problems, which the same person experiences. Depression and anxiety are both associated with self-harm and also with suicidality. And by suicidality, we mean suicidal thoughts, plans and attempts. So depression, anxiety, self-harm and suicidality are, are associated as comorbid conditions, also as risk factors and, and outcomes of each other. So I wanted to say a word on, on mental health in young people. So depression, anxiety, self-harm and suicidality often begin during adolescence and adolescence is now defined as spanning ages 10 to 24. There is quite strong evidence now that these mental health problems are rising in young people and that has made the prevention of these mental health problems a priority. So although higher education students range in age very widely, most of the HE student population are aged between 17 and 25 and this age period is the peak age of onset for these mental health problems in the general population. So I wanted to just give a very quick intro to the epidemiology of these mental health problems in higher education students. So this uh, first bullet point refers to some data from um, HESA and this study found that in the past six years, mental health problems in higher education students have increased. So generally mirroring this general increase in mental health problems within the general population. But according to these data, the mental health problems in HE students have increased by 3.2%. And overall, almost 4% of higher education students in England reported a mental health condition in the academic year between 2018 and 2019. Um, there's also this cross-sectional study of note because this was international and it was done across 21 countries who were included in the World Health Organization surveys. And this study found that the 12 month prevalence in higher education students aged 18 to 22 of any mental health problem was 20%. Anxiety disorders were the most common followed by mood disorders and substance use disorders. And then I also wanted to mention medical students because historically there has always been a lot of epidemiological research on medical students but uh, there does seem to be evidence that the prevalence of mental health problems is particularly high in medical students. So a 2017 systematic review in JAMA Psychiatry uh, reported a 
point prevalence of 27% for depression or depressive symptoms in medical students, which is quite substantially higher than the general population, and also a point prevalence of 11% for suicidal ideation. So, yeah, I just wanted to draw attention to uh, this paper by Anne Duffy and colleagues uh, on mental health care for university students and way forward, which contains a lot of references to the data that I'm presenting at the moment. So that last point about the prevalence of depression potentially being higher in medical students than the general population brings me to my next point, which is there's an obvious question, uh, you know, related to the mental health of higher education students, which is, is the mental health of higher education students similar to, better than or worse than in uh, the age matched section of the general population. So I just wanted to give an example of perhaps the largest, most recent study in the UK, which has investigated or, or compared mental health and higher education students with so-called non-students from the general population. And this study here used uh, various different waves from the Understanding Society data. So on the y-axis here, you can see mean general health questionnaire scores. So these are mean, uh, mean scores on psychological distress or depression and anxiety. And higher scores indicate more severe symptoms. And on the x-axis here, you can see each individual cross-sectional wave of understanding society, which has been done um, from 2010 up to 2019. So the gold line here indicates uh, the mean GHQ score across these time points for the students, and the dashed blue line indicates the mean GHQ score across these time points for the non-students. And you can see that uh, generally, kind of on average across these time points in these data, the students tended to have slightly lower uh, mental health scores or scores on psychological distress compared to the non-students. So not a huge difference, but generally the pattern seems to be that although the prevalence of mental health problems is high in higher education students, it may be slightly lower compared with the rest of the general population. So, you know, even though mental health problems within the HE population may potentially be lower, slightly lower than the general population, the prevalence is still very high. And there are obviously, well, there are likely to be risk factors within higher education settings that increase the risk of people experiencing mental health problems. Many risk factors uh, are likely to be similar to risk factors in the general population. However, it's possible that the exact nature of exposure to certain risk factors and the interventions that are required may differ. So higher education students are likely to experience various stresses that are related to social relationships. So for example, loneliness that results from, you know, the transition to HE and changes to social relationships. Uh, many HE students may be caring for families, experiencing academic demands and intense curriculums. And also there are obviously uh, differences in the financial circumstances of, of, of students compared to the rest of the general population. And recent changes in how HE is, is funded, particularly in England, may, uh, may be linked to um, mental health problems within the HE population. I just wanted to note that more high quality research in this particular area does seem to be needed. So generally, my uh, the conclusions I wanted uh, I wanted to talk about are that the prevalence of common mental health problems such as depression and anxiety, along with suicidality, is high and rising, uh, especially among young people. The transition to higher education and the higher education environment itself may potentially expose people to mental health risk factors. And the prevalence of common mental health problems, self-harm and suicidality is certainly high in higher education settings. And the implication of this, of this evidence is that higher education represents an important window of opportunity for prevention of mental health problems and also access to high quality mental health services. Uh, thank you very much, Gemma. Very, you know, clear uh, presentation and highlighting about the impact of mental health among the HE students. I think it's not only the case uh, being prominent in the UK or Europe, but I think it becomes more, you know, prominent in other parts of the world, even in Asia. So we moved uh, to the second speaker, 
uh, Dr. Amor from Lingnan University, Hong Kong, will share with us about a study about how the uh, current uh, global health crisis has affected the uh, well being of higher education students. So it's the floor to you, uh, Patty. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Mok. I, I hope everybody can hear me clearly. Right. So just like uh, Professor Mok mentioned, I'm presenting something relating to the psychological well-being of international students during this um, COVID-19 pandemic. And we did a study at the start of this pandemic, and we've been following up uh, quite recently um, to get more insight about this. And this is what I want to share with you um, today. So I'll share briefly about some precursors of mental health or psychological ill-being among these students through the survey we conducted, and then some initial thoughts or uh, findings from uh, a qualitative study that we did. And then again, just like Gemma just did, some maybe questions that we can probably discuss later emerging from the analysis that we did. So essentially, I think from the literature and perhaps uh, from all of our experiences, the pandemic has really been something of, um, has brought a lot of pressure and a lot of burden on societies. And most importantly, in higher education, due to all the changes that we have had to make, uh, we have had to make in areas of teaching and uh, how we deliver our teaching and how even normal activities or uh, educational activities uh, are undertaken. And most importantly, it's the literature tends to show that international students are one of the most um, affected um, groups when it comes to um, higher education and actually also has an implication of how universities have to undertake um, higher education um, internationalization in itself. Um, there are questions as to whether, especially things relating to mental health or psychological well-being among international students are even worse uh, than those of local students because of uh, differences in social support, access to financial resources, and uh, migratory or uh, um, citizenship um, issues as well, in a way. So in this um, study, when I say psychological well-being or interchangeably with the opposite side of a psychological distress, generally referring to things about um, the stressful situation, uncomfortable situation that affect the emotions and present as a stressor for people that affect their mental well-being and essentially leads to things about um, depression and, and then anxiety, just like uh, Gemma has um, brilliantly um, expressed to us. And our focus here from our study um, is more or less supported in terms of the international students by uh, this um, stress the uh, process theory uh, by Palin. And it essentially tells us that, especially when we contextualize it in the area of international students, that their mental health in this pandemic is more or less affected by a number of stresses, mainly about, for example, their life events in terms of changes in their, for example, academic routines, issues, especially because of international student issues relating to discrimination, which has more or less be, been some sort of um, strain on many um, uh, historically in a way. And we take example here, like some Asian students which uh, suffered some sort of abuse um, in the early parts of this uh, pandemic. But because of uh, uh, going through the theory, we also realized that factors such as uh, which can moderate or more or less buffer these sort of stresses that affect international students, for example, social support, their health literacy and others tend to be lower because of their migratory status, because this is they tend to study in places that they don't um, originally come from. Um, and all these culminate in terms of their stresses and their moderating factors culminate to affect their outcomes or health outcomes or psychological well-being um, in the context of this study. And essentially, especially at the start of the pandemic and recently, the research tends to show that their mental health well-being and uh, their mental health or the psychological well-being and general needs of international students have been overlooked in several places in a way. And this has culminated into more or less a negative health, uh, mental health outcomes for many of these. So we, in our study, we try to understand some of these um, theoretical perspective in reality, what has really happened. And, we try to look at the experiences of international students uh, using some survey earlier on. Um, and then we followed up with some qualitative study, like I just said. So um, I'm not going to go too much into the survey, but we got responses from people or international students in over 26 countries globally. And um, 
coming from six different continents. So we get a, gl a global perspective about what um, mental health situation of these students. And essentially what we found was that many of them tend to feel that they were at risk or they at risk of this uh, uh, COVID-19. And, and that would be the beginning of things that could really affect their mental health. And many of them tend to agree, uh, tend to agree that during this pandemic, there has been enormous disruption of their studies because of all the changes that I believe many of us are, are much aware. And whether they are satisfied with the education, many tend to, there's a bit of ambivalence as to the impact of the pandemic. And more importantly, the focus of uh, what I'm talking about to you today has to do with the uh, things that could really affect their mental health. Many of them essentially are, were worried about um, their mental health status. I'm sorry, we're worried about the COVID-19. And you see that for those that were really worried and very worried, you combine them and it's just around 80%, I'm um, sorry, about 70% uh, or so. But then we even asked them about their families. Remember many of these people during our survey had, um, were still in the countries where they were studying. And they tend to show that they were even more worried compared to even for themselves about um, their life, uh, about the safety during this pandemic and loneliness um, has something which is, uh, has been very significant among these um, students. So we went ahead to really elicit what and how are these, um, uh, uh, fact, uh, what, what are these factors that are affecting um, the various precursors of mental well-being among these um, international students. So we've started with some qualitative studies to gauge what is um, really going on. So I want to share with you some of the findings about our qualitative studies and in particular also asking them questions about how universities have supported them during this, their evaluation or perception of what universities have done. So at the center of it is about uh, how the, uh, the mental health status of um, the factors that affect their psychological well-being. And one thing that um, stood out essentially, and before I go ahead to share more, is that uh, these interviews are based on experiences of most um, in, um, postgraduate students, both those in research postgraduate and then um, uh, taught postgraduate students in a way. And many of them, of course, coming from Hong Kong. So this, we can take it like a case study from Hong Kong in a sense. So the academic dilemmas here, some of them are worried about the completion of their program. And this is a source of the worry, a source of the uh, academic uh, mental health um, issues if their funding get cut because they are not able to finish on time and um, they are not able to complete, then that means they, get, they don't get their, their findings, uh, sorry, their funding, which is a source of worry. And many of them felt that this has, is really something that is burdening them even as of now, because they, many of them, especially in the social sciences, they want to go for field studies, but then within the pandemic, how do we juggle this in a way? So this is um, one point of it. Social isolation, just like Gemma was mentioning, even among um, students, um, probably local students in England, is something of issue. And international students in um, Hong Kong also felt that. And this uh, brief statement here about one of them wondering, uh, try to go out just to see people, it speaks about the level of loneliness and how um, the, uh, the pressures that were coming to them, that sort of loneliness, which are all precursors for mental health um, issues. And some sort of unexpected hardship, mostly dealing with financial implications. And uh, these, uh, uh, these quotations or these um, cases are coming from people who were on self-funded mostly basis. And because of the changes that have come with, because of the pandemic, it has meant that what they had previously planned before embarking on this journey has had to change. And many of them did not have the funding to be able to support themselves, which is really something um, that were affecting their mental health. Some of them stating here that they were really depressed and were very down in several days. But then these at least give us some perspective about um, their mental, uh, the things that can affect their mental health um, issues. But then what has universities been doing to support them and how do they see this sort of support? Mostly some of them felt that especially those that were on self-funded basis, accommodation has really been a problem. Universities were still, some universities were still asking them for um, fees or uh, charging them for fees for their hostels and others, which they couldn't afford. So imagine being in a foreign country, you um, studies and everything, social activities are gone and you also are facing ch financial challenges and probably an eviction because of financial worries in a way. Again, but then we see on the flip side that many of them or some of them also do appreciate some efforts. And we take note here about 
university is giving them support in terms of, for example, provision mask and other um, hygienic product products for them to be able to cope um, and abstain from the, um, the pandemic. And something that stood up that many of them tend to uh, say, and I think maybe we can discuss later on about how universities, some universities in Hong Kong actually provided accommodation for them to, um, sorry, encourage them to come to Hong Kong to study, but at the same time, providing some financial support for them to be able to um, cater for quarantine and other arrangements in a way. So these sort of balance, um, these um, points tend to give us a perspective about the different ways of their mental health challenges and then how um, in the various ways that universities can support um, these students in ways that could probably remedy the potential mental health um, challenges. So in conclusion, uh, what I'm saying here, uh, what uh, I tend to, I'm trying to put out here is that indeed mental health situation in, in, in among international students is something real and a major concern. And the, major, the causes of it are very diverse, uh, stemming from financial issues and others. And human relations, I think we, probably universities, this is something we need to re really think about because we've been relying a lot, a lot on technologies, but I think it has its limits that we need to think about, especially when we are trying to replace um, physical human interactions. Also, maybe we need to rethink about um, the various support, uh, sort of support mechanisms available um, to students, especially things to do with mental health services on campus. And many of our participants, again, going back to our findings, did not really um, know and were, do not really, uh, were not really aware about these sort of um, opportunities. So it may be a, 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 an opportunity for universities to rethink about these. And, also help to connect these international students because um, their knowledge about this, um, the local system tend to differ, um, tend to be low um, compared to, for example, local students. So we may need to really um, connect them to not, this, not just the health system, but also the local other support system. And then more importantly, looking at the importance of social relationship. Maybe university have to intervene in how we can reconfigure social relationships and network within this context so that um, you, uh, international students can feel more um, protected in terms of social support in um, similar situations in the future. And if you look at our funding, findings closely, you see that the financial aspect is really, um, it, it emerges critically. So maybe universities may need to think about the funding arrangement for international students um, going forward, how we can um, support them um, differently. And then perhaps also we may need to think about how especially postgraduate research um, approaches, uh, postgraduate research is, is conducted in a way, especially in areas of um, social sciences and um, business fields. And that's where some of our participants um, came from. It tends to speak that there are some challenges that could potentially um, in your or trigger a mental health um, challenge. So um, this is what I want to share with everybody. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Pamela, for reflecting upon how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected uh, international student well-being and how their mental health issue will be dealt with by university authorities. So uh, the first speaker of this panel is uh, Dr. Jason Ardick from Durham University. He will share with us about the topic related to mental health and ethnic minority. Jason, it's your floor. Thank you so much. That's so kind of you. Um, firstly, greetings, everyone, from wherever you are. I hope you're all keeping well. Um, I had two fantastic speakers in, in Paddy and Gemma and kind of really talking and crystallising the, the student context. And kind of what I want to just draw a bit of focus towards is the... Um, staff context but particularly within a black and ethnic minority um, context so one of the things that i think is really important in these um times is really this state of hyper vigilance that um black and ethnic minority people are continuously um have to be in um, when we think about how institutional racism and how systemic racism kind of pervades and i suppose one of the things that is really important within all of that is space and culture and the kind of monotony of these spaces as a as a as a tool of violence as an instrument of violence particularly when we think about how people engage with you know instances of racism in many in its many different forms so you know systemic institutional microaggressive and i suppose you know when we think about mental health and particularly um you know how racism works in many respects it's 
it just kind of cause of several lacerations. You know, we think of the microaggression, it's death by a thousand cuts. And it's cumulative. And that can erode and it can wear on um, a healthy mental state and mental wellness. And one of the things that um, has become kind of subsumed within kind of mental health um, literature and discourse and commentaries, um, there has been kind of an exclusion of the experience of black and ethnic minority people. And specifically, more importantly, the impact of race and racism on um, psychological um, state. So what I kind of want to do in this brief kind of the next four or five minutes is really to talk about um, what some of the issues are, one or two of the issues, and to really talk about kind of some of the conclusions drawn and where we need to move to as a sector in terms of, I guess, um, spoiler alert, providing more, um, so, you know, better psychological interventions for black and ethnic minority people encountering, um, encountering racism. So I think kind of the first thing is that when we kind of think about the sector, generally speaking, we think about the lack of representation, the lack of belonging, there is a, there, there is an impact, there is an impact to that. And, you know, very often there is a lot of kind of untold trauma that a lot of people who um, experience racism very often they're not given platforms to discuss that. Their experiences aren't centered, they're not centered um, when they engage in psychological intervention. So specifically, let's just say counseling, for example, um, that as an intervention, very often in a lot of the research that I've done, there has been a lot of gaslighting or kind of um, accusations in, in many respects, and that's what it's referred to, of hypersensitivity. And actually, you know, um, a drilling down in terms of the locus of the problem. So Oh, sorry, um, in terms of the locus of the problem and the locus of the problem generally being perceived to be, um, you know, could it be something external from racism? So in other words, there is a, there's this kind of this gaslighting that ensues, which suggests that it's subjective in conjecture. And actually that isn't the root cause of the problem. And again, it's that kind of double experience of kind of racialization. It's compounded by that first interventory period where you, you know, at, at the first point of contact, you know, you discuss these feelings of um, racism, only to have them thwarted um, by someone who may say, a mental health professional who may suggest that actually this may be something else other than racism, um, which in itself is obviously disheartening and decenters racism. So that's kind of one of the first things. And I guess the, the response to something like that could well be to ensure that we think about the types of training that mental health professionals receive. So are there culturally appropriate um, training interventions for mental health professionals? Can that be embedded within their training before they go into the professional um, psychological arena? Because there is a disadvantage um, in terms of not understanding that knowledge and potentially not helping black and ethnic minority people as well as they could be, particularly at that first point of contact, which we all recognize to be a really crucial point because it's that whole kind of narrative around the first thing is to seek help. So if at that first point we're seeking help, black and ethnic minority people seek help. And then at that first point, our experiences of being kind of subverted into something that could be purely subjective in conjecture, that is problematic. Secondly, one of the things that I think is important is recognizing that we, you know, from, from a psychological lens, and if you think about um, psychotherapy, we operate from a very white dominant um, Eurocentric lens. So in terms of the practices that we adopt and that we use, um, they are very European based and very much lend itself um, to a European conception of psych, so, you know, psychology and mental health engagement. And when we think about, you know, racialization and trauma that that um, embodies, there is a bespoke type of mental health um, engagement that is required to really um, begin to make that process as cathartic as possible. And the absence of that learning has been to the detriment of black and ethnic minority people seeking out um, mental health interventions. So for example, when we think about um, treatments often afforded to black and ethnic minority people, very often cognitive therapies are not often suggested. Very, very often, actually, there is a push towards medi medication straight away. And what we do know is that while medication can serve a purpose, 
um, we should all really try and advocate as much as possible. Sometimes there may need to be a blend of both, but we should advocate as much as possible, um, a cognitive approach towards engaging with understanding the process of why someone's altered mental state may be the way it is. So when we kind of think about those types of things, that's really, really important. And when we think about higher education specifically, what a lot of my research has found is that staff and, you know, staff and students, but staff um, primarily for the context of this conversation, don't have an outlet to express um, these um, incidences of racism, don't have an outlet to express the talk that this has had on their mental faculties and their mental state. And actually, there are not many opportunities for them to talk about um, how this compromised their mental state, because there is historically within the black and ethnic minority community, a distrust of uh, mental health services because of what has happened historically in terms of black and ethnic minority people accessing mental health um, services. So there's been a dehumanization, which is normally involved potentially sectioning um, or um, heavily sedating uh, black and ethnic minority people, particularly black and ethnic minority men. And we also know about deaths in custody and we know how this impacts people's impressions in higher education um, in terms of accessing this help. So I guess in conclusion, one of the things that I would kind of allude to is that, you know, the contours of racism are forever changing. And because of that, people will encounter new forms um, of trauma. Um, those forms of trauma will be, I guess, in, in many respects, what Malcolm X said, you know, racism is like a Cadillac, a new model comes out every year. There'll be new models of racism. To trace the contours of this means that there is a hypervigilance that will be, exhaust that will be exhausted for black and ethnic minority people. And that will inevitably compromise mental wellness, psychological state, mental health. And so it is important that we think about, um, one, how we begin to diversify um, the mental health sector in terms of the practitioners and the professionals we have, what interventions can we put in place? How do we attract more black and ethnic minority people into the profession? How do we make um, existing professionals, which is overwhelmingly white, how do we make them more culturally and racially cognizant and provide them with a literature or a lexicon to be able to better support and help black and ethnic minority um, people? Um, staff and students in the sector. So thank you so much uh, for your time. I'm really grateful and um, I look forward to hearing everyone's thoughts. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Jason, for highlighting the importance of, you know, course cultural understanding, and especially when deciding about the intervention appropriately to different cultural groups, especially for minority, ethnic minorities. So thank you very much for three speakers putting uh, the panels together. So I think the floor is now open. If you refer to the chat room, there are a number of uh, questions being raised already. So I just wonder whether our speaker want to uh, respond. One uh, question is about uh, talking about uh, uh, similar study to uh, pet moss. Another one is about Jen, you're talking about online and how to engage uh, as students. So any response at this point uh, from our three speakers, if we go back to the chat room. Um, Anyone want to uh, start first? I think there were some earlier one for Gemma. I don't know whether she is going yeah, to- Some of the questions are addressing to Gemma. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Paddy and Kaho. I think so. there was one for me about, um, let me scroll up a second. Uh, yeah, so so Rachel has asked, can I say anything about cross-national differences in students' mental health? Uh, in her research, concerns about mental health were raised by students across Europe, but interestingly not in Poland. And then an interesting comment about the wider societal discourse and how this might impact reporting of mental health problems. So I, I presented data from one, one cross-national study in my presentation. Um, I've just checked and the the 21 countries that that study looked at did include Poland. However, unfortunately, uh, these sample sizes per country were too small to do a cross-national comparison between the individual countries. So I don't think we really know quantitatively whether the prevalence of mental health problems differs in higher education institutions across countries. It seems very feasible that it would given the you know extreme differences between how mental health sorry how higher education is structured cross-nationally and um, I think that the wider societal discourse about mental health is obviously very important in terms of 
you know, stigma, how stigma towards mental health problems is treated at a societal level can obviously impact upon both treatment seeking and also reporting of mental health problems. So I'm sure that that does have an impact. How about Paddy? I have one of the yeah. questions addressed to you, the last one. Okay, okay. so um, I think uh, there was one by um, Sharon. Um, Sharon Clearance uh, asking whether the switch to online can affect students' um, mental health. Um, I think um, in, our, in, our, in our study, I think, uh, and then follow up with a qualitative study, maybe I couldn't have time to share all those, but essentially the, the, the source of loneliness was mainly attributed to the fact that students were studying online. So that means there's a limitation to their socialization with their, their classmates and even their professors and others. So that sort of um, causal, uh, that sort of relationship about their online classes, being alone with your computer and absence of your um, um, social network or maybe a mate and others tend to have an effect on loneliness and then by extension can also um, trigger some mental health um, challenges in a way. So I think um, there is that sort of connection there. And um, um, Zuho um, from I think Turkey saying he's also um, conducting a similar study and whether there's some regional um, perspective. I, I believe there should be because the, the cultural differences, because earlier on in the pandemic, we realized that, um, for example, Asian students in the UK and others were suffering, um, were, were, were at the receiving end of um, several uh, discriminatory antics and behaviors and others in a way. But then if you compare to those international students in the Asian region, maybe the dynamics are different, at least um, speaking from Hong Kong in a way, at least from us and the study and then the interviews we've done so far, there's, there, hardly do we see anything relating to, um, for example, discrimination or any forms of, you know, that um, sort of racial um, differences and others. So I definitely, I think, the cultural differences across regions and countries um, are certainly something that we can look at. So I think it paves way for um, perhaps a comparative analysis of how yeah. that works. So, yeah. Yeah. Before I invite Jason to respond, uh, so how I, I see I see you, you know, and on screen. Do you want yeah. to intervene at this point, please? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for the contribution first. Uh, um, the study which I have been conducting uh, has not, yeah, I have not finished it yet, but I can see that there are some differences between, uh, as I have just said, uh, particularly in terms of cultural atmosphere, because uh, in my study, I have uh, found, I can say I have found so far that the students, the, particularly in Konya, I'm living in the center of Turkey. In Konya, the students, uh, uh, I cannot say that they feel at home, yes, but they, I, can, I, can, I can see that uh, they can handle with the problem uh, a bit more easily thanks to the support given by some institutions, uh, particularly financial uh, supports and also um, uh, uh, the psychological supports, uh, 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 that's a, a qualitative uh, uh, study, uh, which I have been <laughs> dealing uh, now. Uh, maybe later I can give more uh, information, but I can see some difference because they, they say that uh, thanks to the, thanks to the, uh, those contributions, particularly financial, I mean, and also psychological, uh, they say they, for example, they do not have to leave our country. Uh, that they can stay and they can stay in uh, the uh, dormitories and uh, and it also they are given some others not, not scholarships but uh, as I have just said financial support uh, that might be uh, that might be interesting and uh, uh, and the participants are also important because uh, the participants uh, in my study uh, for example uh, belong to uh, some other uh, Turkish origin countries, also some, some students from Africa. And uh, that might be also another reason. Maybe we can discuss in another meeting and maybe yeah. we can compare the com uh, to studies together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. thank you. Yeah, Jason, I saw some question addressing to you. Could you mind you know, uh, taking the question? Yes, I believe that question is from Claire. 
Yes, uh, yeah. it is. So, if you want yeah. me to try and explain what I'm asking, I, I don't think I wrote it very well, Jason. No, that'd be so, great. Thank you, um, so my sense is that black staff carry the load of white staff. And what I mean by that is that, um, and at Birkbeck, um, it's a very diverse student population. And understandably, the black students go to the black members of staff. And in, in other words, they carry our load. Yeah. Um, and that must put a hell of a lot of additional pressure upon them over and above the issues of racism that they are personally experiencing, as well as carrying their students' racism. Does yeah. that, am I making sense? No, you, you're making and perfect I feel sense. that as white members of staff, we get protected, we get, but by the, the additional responsibilities that black staff are taking, sort of, uh, they're doing our dirty work. I, I, I mean, I don't mean that offensively, yeah, they are, course, course, yeah. but they are, they are carrying what we should be carrying, but we, but, but students understandably don't want to come to us as white members of staff. Yeah, and I, I think there's, there's there's so many kind of different tenets to kind of what you're saying. I think one of the main things is, um, you know, how do we make all staff, you know, because um, I, would, I would say that black and ethnic minority staff, generally speaking, are quite racially literate. So how do we make all staff racially literate so that students can, you know, uh, particularly students of colour, yep. can feel like they can approach a white academic or white professional member of staff and discuss these racialized issues with them because um, is that absence of connectivity and a feeling that one might not understand, which then ends up putting pressure on black and ethnic minority staff to deal with that and who who, who reside few in number anyway. I mean, when we talk about the numbers, we, we all know numbers, 35 black female professors, you know, a sector that has just under 14% black and ethnic minority academics in the sector. So it's a very small populace of academics anyway in any one given institution and finding ways for that labour to be distributed does become really important because for a lot of black and ethnic minority staff also what adds to this kind of mental strain is the fact that it doesn't actually very often this work is not remunerated it's not acknowledged there's no reputational value in doing so at least internally within the institution and it's not it doesn't allow to any kind of it's not recognized for any kind of career progression so all of those things kind of create this really the toxicity of it creates this horrible cocktail really of pressure, insurmountable pressure on already pressurized black and ethnic minority people. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. I, I see a long yellow comment uh, on the chat room asking you uh, to comment about uh, what is then the better platform or approach in dealing with the mental health students because um, the, the, the issue is slow. There's no one size with all therapeutic strategies. Do you want to comment on that one? Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna read. Um, so I think the tendency towards offering CBT as a one size fits all strategy is not always the right approach for everyone. Yes, uh, I, I would agree. It's, it's, it's not always, um, it's not always the right approach and it is a one size fits all approach. But I think when we're talking about black and ethnic minority, um, people who have a distrust of uh, mental health interventions um, who haven't always historically been um, afforded the opportunity to, to engage in cognitive um, psychological interventions then I do think it's important that we think about how we can have interventions that kind of better support um, individuals in that space. I'm just reading kind of second part of the question, which is I'd love to know more about platforms or groups advocating for better support for BAME students. Um, to be honest, um, there, there are quite a few. So there are um, Leading Roots, um, who are kind of a grassroots organisation doing work around providing better platforms for Black and ethnic minority students. Um, there are organisations um, or fractions of, for example, MIND and um, the Black Psychological Centre. Um, which kind of works specifically with um, black and ethnic minority people um, in terms of how to navigate institutional barriers. Um, there are also, um, there is also a, 
a growing cabal of people within the sector that are kind of providing lots of different uh, minor interventions. So for example, Black Unity based in Birmingham, um, centers for black studies in universities such as University of Leeds, for example, Birmingham have a center. Um, there are other places in UCL, for example, city where there's kind of burgeoning cultures of um, sector interventions designed to help better support um, black and ethnic minority staff. And I guess the most prevalent thing would be the REC and um, the Race Equality Charter within the UK context has really cultivated a culture of at least universities now having to take racial equity um, a lot more seriously. So, um, I mean, that there are lots of things and you, like I said, you have the black curriculum in a black university. There are several interventions, but I guess the most important thing is finding a way to have all people engage in this and not it really be the um, burden or the locust of, of black and ethnic minority people. Okay, thank you, Jason. So I think uh, the free speaker has brought out a very important issue for higher education, you know, uh, uh, a college to rethink and also to reflect upon in what way we can help our uh, higher education student for well-being. So we are going through the experience about COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, do a uh, speaker want to comment on in what way the universities or higher education institutes should adopt different approaches in addressing the well-being issue for uh, for mental health well-being for higher education students? Any comments, Drama? What was that? Sorry, Kaho. How how can your your mic is off? Yeah. What what your universities should do in addressing the issue? The impact of the pandemic on students' yeah. mental health. As, as well as mental health. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, so I think that's, so perhaps I'll comment more generally on what universities should do in response to student mental health generally, given, um, and just pick up on a question by Victorita from earlier, which was how has the pandemic affected student mental health? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think in order to know the answer to this, we would need high quality data on the same cohort of students before and after the pandemic. And data like that are quite rare. In the general population, there has been two cohorts, Al Spack and also Generation Scotland, where they've looked at the mental health of young people before and after the pandemic and found that anxiety levels have increased in young people, which is obviously you know, completely understandable and probably applies to the higher education population as well. Anxiety levels have increased. So, I think there's a wider debate about whether higher education institutions should lead an improvement in the provision of mental health services for young people, uh, sorry, for higher education students, given the um, observation that community mental health services such as GP services and also hospital services may not be well positioned to help students who are mm. quite an itinerant population who are away from home and in the university for a short period of time. So I think strengthening mental health services in and around campus is an important thing to do. Exactly how that can be done, I don't know an awful lot about, but um, I think, you know, improving the clinical triage uh, um, system and also strengthening access to high quality mental health care provided by the HE sector is probably um, a beneficial way to go. Mm -hmm. Well, because in Hong Kong, we are, are, are facing about the mental health issue of higher education students, uh, the government rolled out more uh, funding support and putting resources on campuses by, by hiring more counselors in support of students' mental well-being. This is one way. So Victoria, we want to intervene at that point, Victoria. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, congratulations for uh, uh, for Gemma. Uh, she asked to my question. Uh, I appreciate uh, the analysis of risk factors within higher education from uh, uh, the article. And uh, in my opinion, the emotional symptoms are very important. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, I agree. <clears throat> thank you. Any response from Jason or Patty? 
Um, I'm so, mindful that uh, I've occupied a lot of the floor yeah. already. So, Paddy, sorry. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think about um, how what universities can do. Um, I think it, probably I'll, I'll go back to the, the final part of my, my presentation. Um, and especially going back again, because I, one of the things I was mentioning had to do with financial support again. Because um, many, um, and I'm speaking in the context of, by the way. So many of them, you realize that, excuse me to say, the source of their, their worries was financial related. And I think from our discussion, um, Zuha also states that from the experience of international students in Turkey, that the financial um, support is um, key to alleviating a lot of the challenges because the pandemic, the pandemic more or less brought among the international students questions of more or less, how am I going to first um, avoid being infected? And while doing that, how do I support myself financially during this, um, uh, during this period um, in terms of um, academically, um, the financial uh, support for academic and then also things like accommodation and others, which are um, very useful. Um, so the financial aspect, just like you mentioned. Another thing I realized is the social network. So I didn't get a chance to really explain, but in the pandemic, obviously have told us that the social network is critical, but then it means that we need to find a way to reconfigure how it is done, at least in this context going forward. So um, reflecting on this, I think maybe universities probably could engage more, especially with these international students, because they tend to have some of these small, small informal groups that's more like they generate some sort of social support from. So maybe aside from the, um, maybe the institutionalized um, services that are provided, maybe we could work, uh, work through, universities could work through some of these small, small um, groups that they have. So for example, in many places, they'll have maybe students from Turkey Association studying, studying in, the, in the UK, or maybe that's sort of a small, small situations. The universities, they can be a target for universities in terms of helping them um, in, in whatever way that they can, in a way. So I think those are the two things I want to say. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Paddy. So I see one uh, yellow chat uh, question from Karis Kuba to everyone. And uh, I just wonder whether uh, colleagues, uh, uh, panelists want to respond. Yes, do you want to answer? Sorry. Sorry, yeah, I should actually say that. It, so it was more, I should have written that this was for um, Jason, but also interested in um, everyone's response. So I was interested following um, the Black Lives Matter movement, there were a lot of um, statements and commitments made by universities, um, various training put on, um, lots of focus on talking about racism in, in higher education and uh, different experiences of black and ethnic minority students and staff. Um, and so that's what I've seen um, play out in front of me, but I was just wondering if you could comment on whether or not this has made any real difference to uh, the experiences of staff and, student, uh, and students. Is this momentum continuing? Um, has the kind of support that's been offered actually made a difference uh, to people's experiences or is it too early to, to comment on that? Thank you so much for your um, question, Karis. I, I mean, I, I guess in many respects, it, I think it's fair to say that it was quite reactionary, um, which actually isn't such a bad thing. What would be great is if we can turn that reactionary kind of reflex into something sustainable. So, um, I think if we're able to sustain that, and I think it's the first time really, you know, that you know, race and racism and its kind of psychological impacts and all the other things that encase, you know, this in terms of Black Lives Matter has gone from the political margins to the political center and the societal center. And it's really how long it will stay there for. Now I'm hoping it will stay there and it will be regarded as paramount importance along with other intersections which are just as important and we don't reside in this hierarchy of infection where we place certain intersections above others and then we prioritize them and often race is always at the bottom of this. I do think we're seeing kind of small gains and I think you know we've really seen something revolutionary happen in many respects in the last 10 months so still we're still in the kind of fetal um, or embryonic stages of this process. But what I do think is that there is something to suggest that um, 
that there is an appetite for cultures to change within institutions. But I think that's only going to be um, underpinned and propelled by um, sustained approaches and interventions towards dismantling racism. And more importantly, embedding that and enshrining it within um, university strategic aims over a five to seven year period and ensuring that it's fiscally and humanly well resourced. Uh, there's a question for Paddy uh, from Robert. Uh, what was the most visited office by students to seek help during COVID-19? Paddy, any response? Yes, thank you very much, Robert, for that. So um, actually, this is uh, maybe um, most visited is more quantitative, so I cannot really quantify. Um, but then in the, um, the qualitative study, what we realized is that when we ask about services for universities, some of the students were not really aware about the counseling services that is available to them. So more or less what they did was informal. They talked to their friends, their family back home and others, which is why one of my earlier proposals was more or less targeting these sort of social network as a way, at least that is where we can even reach to, out um, to them about uh, maybe the official institutional arrangement to seek counseling and others. So um, yeah, that is what I would say about it. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I think uh, the time is running short for this session. I just wonder whether uh, the panelists would have the last word to say before we close the session. Um, I think the, the, there's a sort of a breakout room, um, I'm not sure. Yes, yeah, yes. So there is a breakout room where we can continue the discussion, and the link has just been um, placed yeah, in the chat. In the chat room, there's a breakout room. I think if colleagues want to continue the conversation, please do so by clicking the link. Okay, thank you very much for the three speakers. Uh, wonderful talk. I think uh, you raised the awareness of, among us and in working in the higher education sector to be aware about the well being of young people, not only about our higher education uh, young people, but I think the young generation they are facing about the very huge uh, challenge when uh, going through the youth transition from education to work or uh, proceeding from high school to university. I think it uh, needs our attention. So thank you very much for um, very in, uh, stimulating talks together and go on our discussion. Thank you. Thanks all speakers.